Welcome back to Path Working with Archangels. Now, in the last episode, we got to the top of the tree. We experienced the brilliant, brilliant light of the Metatron and the deep, deep, intense darkness of the Shekinah. And we recognised that they were a couple inex inextricably, inextricably connected to each other as a creative powerhouse. So this is the word, power. This is the crown of the tree where the energy resides, like a, as a monarch has. And then the monarch has wisdom as a tool and love as a tool. I sometimes think that's rather like um, in, in Britain when we crown the monarch, they put a crown on her head and then she has a, an orb and a scepter. Uh, the orb is round so I tend to think of that as the love and the scepter is the wisdom. That's my little thought about it anyway. It's quite a useful way of thinking about this throne having three um, uh, sub qualities to it because it's all come from something further away, something that we can hardly compute. If we went above the crown, we would completely dissolve. But when we meditate, we're attempting to get to the crown so that we realise who we are and we get crowned. We take up our own sovereignty within ourselves. So that's part of our journey to reach up towards that um, out of our ordinary everyday personal lives and to take on something deeper, higher you could say, in fact higher or deeper doesn't really matter. So that's where we arrived yesterday um, and I'll have a few more words to say about that in a moment. But first of all, I want to answer some really useful questions that I've been given by Elena. So thank you, Elena, for giving me your first name, because I do know how to say that. I think I've got that right. So Elena gave me two questions, and I think they're really useful for everybody. So her first question was, when you're doing path working, and you've got your um, uh, pictures on the floor, so you can walk up and speak to each archangel as you go, how to pace yourself. Okay, well, how much time have you got? Don't rush it. Be willing to stand by just one of them for a while and not move on until you've spoken to the next one. In order to speak to the next one, don't rush to go. You can experiment with walking up one side of the tree and then when you get to one of those pairs, for example, if you're walking up the side of the tree where you find Haniel, you could just glance over to the other side where Raphael is and you can see how you feel about the pair of them. When I run this in workshops, I give people at least half an hour to work through the bottom half of the tree because that's the part of the tree which resonates with your everyday life more than, well, the spiritual side of it has got to be dealt with as well. But you need to address what's going on in your personal life, all the practical things. And then you start to say, okay, how can I integrate my spiritual needs into that? So, I very much encourage people to look at the two parts of the tree as um, separate journeys. Get the first, the, the lower part of the tree, okay. That's grounding, really. So that mention of grounding leads me to Eleanor's second question. She says she's um, a Reiki practitioner and she uses it for herself and for her clients. And she asked me, do the archangels have anything to do with the chakras? Right, okay. So one thing that's very obvious 
to me, it's always been obvious to me anyway, that um, although I did mention it to my um, um, Jewish mystical supervisor at the, at the university, and he didn't know anything about yoga, so he couldn't comment. But when I first came across the Tree of Life, and I realized that there were some similarities with the yogic tradition. So in yoga, we have three major channels. There are more than three altogether, but there's a shashumna, which goes up the center, just like our pillar of balance. We have the ida and the pingala. The ida is like the um, side of the tree, the feminine yin side of the tree. It's associated with the moon um, and it's white and it's cold. And then the pingala is associated with the active side of, of, of the uh, energy flow, which would be the equivalent of the active pillar. And um, the pingala is associated with the sun and it's masculine and it's red. So in the um, yogic system, the Ida and the Pingala are winding like this, up across the Shimshimna, but they end at the nostrils. The, the, the Ida at the left and the Pingala at the right. The Shimshimna doesn't end until it gets to the crown. Right. So there's this constant weaving of the energies. In our diagrammatic picture of the Tree of Life from Kabbalah, it seems like the pillars are like that and like that and like that. But I would see no problem at all in redrawing the Kabbalah Tree of Life and making it weave like this, like this. It's, it's, it's an identical model and I strongly suspect that it has some historical background by which it has um, uh, come from the same source, or it's come from the same traditional wisdom. I apologise if there was a short glitch there. I had a postman knocking very loudly at my door. So what I was just covering was the fact that the yogic system and the tree of life system have very strong connections as far as I can see. They have um, an active and a passive pillar, or they have um, a feminine or a masculine um, uh, channel. Um, so how does that relate to the chakras? Well, in the yogic system, as the two um, uh, complementary channels weave across each other, at the points where they cross are where we get the chakras. So there are seven of them. Now, if you look at the tree of life, you could take the um, outer pillars and where we have the pairs, for example, uh, Raphael and Haniel, if you squash them together onto the central pillar, and if you go further up and you do the same with Zadkiel and Samuel and squash them to the central pillar, and then if you go right up to the top and take Raziel and Zafgil and bring those to the central pillar, you would then get a series of centers up the pillar of balance, but you would actually have eight in total. So, <laughs> starting from the bottom, we would not count Sandalfon and Oriel, they're already a pair anyway. So the next one up the tree would be our root chakra. So that's Gabriel. So then, so, so then we have, um, what have we got, this, uh, the sacral. So that would be Hani or Raphael. Then we get, uh, I'm losing track of soon. We, uh, we get the, uh, uh, yeah, we get the solar plexus. I did myself a little diagram before I started so I could recall it. Or, so we get the, the root, the sacral, the solar plexus. That's where Michael is, solar. Then we get the heart. That would be where Zadkiel and Samuel are. Then we get to the throat. And that is where Dat is. 
And I find that really interesting because sound is the most creative force uh, that we have as human beings using the sounds. Then the next uh, space that we get to would be the third eye, the brow. That would be uh, where Raziel and Zafiel are. And then we get to the crown. So, yes, I've often thought that we can apply the concept of chakras or wheels of energy to the um, sephirot. And we can see them as if we, if we brought them in in the same way as the yogic system does, we would get those crossovers. And they would cross over and then they would come out again. So it would be this kind of weaving pattern. Um, I hope that um, uh, my um, help, uh, the answer to your question, Elena, has been really useful. Uh, and I think it's a very interesting question for anybody who's working with healing. When I teach uh, Schaefer healing, we do work with the Sephirot as separate energy centers and not always with chakras. So Schaefer healing doesn't particularly focus on chakras but it doesn't it's, just, it's not ignoring them um, but there's a slightly different way of working than you would experience with with a reiki tradition so i hope uh, i've covered that uh, for you alayda and i hope that's interesting to other people watching this who may also be reiki healers or or, or work with yoga in some way and uh, Actually, the overall, the overarching um, philosophy or attempt behind it is the balancing of the energy field um, and uh, allowing those two contrary or complementary energies to work with each other in a harmonious way. Oh, and I just go back to the issue of well, what happens with number eight at the bottom? So here's a way of looking at it. The couple at the bottom are in the kingdom. Ideally, that would be heaven on earth. Ideally, that would be a kind of paradise, a kind of garden of Eden. And I find it very interesting that the Garden of Eden story has this idea of a snake. Um, and that the snake, with the knowledge that the snake gives, is actually what is deemed to be, um, uh, you know, something punishable, right? Because it's so powerful, of course. And then, of course, with the, um, with the yogic tradition, the snake resides in the root at the bottom. So if we're in the Garden of Eden, in the Sephirot at the bottom, the Sephirot at the bottom, the kingdom, if we're in the Garden of Eden and we release the energy, the snake energy, which can ascend right at the center, if it's correctly opened up, if it goes wibbly wobbly, then you've got serious trouble for the practitioner. But if we release that knowledge tied up in the snake, the, 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 the tree of life and the tree of knowledge, energy, if it goes up the center and gets crowned, then the person is illuminated and they have Come to a state of self-realization and that's exactly the same with the tree of life knowing those energies and working with them harmoniously is the, the the goal purpose of both the yogic tradition and the kabbalistic mysticism so that brings us back to the crown uh, that we were just talking about we were just talking about metatron and the sheep cleaner and uh, Raziel and Zafkil. And so the crown in the Kabbalah is the crown chakra in yoga. And we could say that um, uh, Raziel and Zafkil represent the opening of the third eye. So that's an opening. Zafkil and Raziel may be the two halves of the hemispheres of the brain. And then the third eye opens and it incorporates both energies so that love and wisdom are not in challenging to each other, they are whole and complete. This is a new way of perceiving the world. That's what we find when we work with that top three.
So in tomorrow's episode, no, it won't be actually tomorrow, it will be the next episode, the one after, the day after, I want to work to show you how we can bring that energy from the top of the tree back into our daily life and ground it at the foot of the tree, descending back downwards. So I hope that was useful. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry there was a slight interruption in the middle of it, um, but um, uh, with the help of Will editing it, it might not be such a big interruption as I think it was. So thank you, Elena, for your questions. Keep um, focusing on how you can integrate power, love and wisdom into your personal life. I shall see you in a day or so's time. Goodbye.